This podcast discusses domestic violence, criminal behavior, murder, and adult themes. While not explicit, listener discretion is advised. Steve Powell's fingers tapped at the keys. He typed out an email to West Valley Police in mid-January of 2010, about five weeks after his daughter-in-law Susan's unsolved disappearance. Steve wanted to know if police were looking into any other persons of interest beside his son, Josh. Steve had someone to suggest, a man named Tim Peterson. Here is what he wrote. We are developing a resume of sorts on Tim Peterson, possibly to send to the media. Peterson and his family lived in Josh and Susan's West Valley neighborhood. In the summer of 2009, before Susan disappeared, both Tim and his wife Crystal had offered Susan advice about divorce and marriage counseling. Crystal had given Susan hand-me-down clothes for her sons Charlie and Brayden to wear. Tim, under pressure from Josh, had offered the Powells his backyard swing set. His kids had outgrown it. Then Susan vanished. Tim suspected Josh was responsible. Late one December evening, he drove his truck and trailer over to the Powell house on Sarah Circle. He started backing into the yard, intent on retrieving the swing set. But the trailer clipped a fence and became mired in the snow. Josh's brother Michael, observing this, told Tim to leave. Tim refused. Michael threatened to call the police. TV news crews, camped out in the cul-de-sac, watched in disbelief. The next day, Michael told a detective he'd remembered having a phone conversation with Susan a few weeks before she had disappeared. He claimed Susan had mentioned a neighbor guy who was getting too close for comfort. Michael said his name was Tim Peterson. This was the first the police had heard of it, and they had no way of verifying Michael's claim. But it was all Steve Powell needed to paint Peterson as a scapegoat. Here again is what Steve wrote in his email. Since Tim Peterson's violent show the other night, Josh had begun to look at him differently and was taken aback to since learn that Peterson was trying to break up the Powell's marriage. Steve wondered if Peterson might have kidnapped Susan. Maybe, he suggested, she'd called him for a ride to work the morning of December 7th when Josh was out on the Pony Express trail with the boys, and that is when Peterson did something terrible. Tim told me Josh had tried to make him into a patsy. Before she went missing, he was almost like trying to get me to hang out with his wife. But it didn't work. In the weeks and months that followed, Tim would go so far as to take a lie detector test. It ruled him out as a suspect. When police obtained copies of Susan's emails, they were able to read exactly what he had told her about Josh. I knew this guy was a piece of crap and uh, that he was trouble. And I tried so hard to, to explain that to uh, Susan and help her to understand that he's a sociopath and and being such uh, everything is an asset or a liability. And that's how he looks at people. Asset or liability. And if you decide to try and get a divorce from him, you then become a liability and you're going to take away things that belong to him, his assets. And there won't be any, any doing of that, especially as kids. This is Cold, Episode 9, Light of Seattle. I'm Dave Colley. Back after this. There are so many aspects to the Susan Powell investigation, it's been hard to get them all into cold. If you want even more exclusive details regarding Susan's story, head over to Wondery.com plus and sign up now for access to bonus content you won't find anywhere else. That's Wondery.com plus. Again, W-O-N-D-E-R-Y dot com P-L-U-S to hear three bonus episodes you won't get anywhere else.
J. Brooks Jewelers, locally owned and operated, where the owner is on-site working with customers to provide years of experience and jewelry expertise. Murray and Lehigh, J. Brooks Jewelers, passionate about being part of your life celebrations. Steve Powell's email to the police about Tim Peterson included a clue he might not have intended to provide. At the bottom of the message was a footer, a piece of text automatically added to all of Steve's outgoing emails. It read, Hear the music at www.stevechantry.com I can love you in a secret way I can love you each and every day Following that link took the reader to a website with a nighttime photo of Steve sitting in front of Elliott Bay with the Seattle skyline reflected in the water behind him. The banner text at the top of the page read, Music of Steve Chantry, in a cursive font. Steve Chantry is a very creative individual. That's why he's a writer. That's why he's a singer. That's why he's a musician. That is Ellis Maxwell, the now-retired police detective who led the investigation into Susan Powell's disappearance. He and the rest of the major crimes team took a great interest in Steve's website. A navigation bar on the left-hand side included a link for an album titled Light of Seattle. It also had lyrics for 12 songs. One, titled I Said I Love You, seemed particularly disturbing given what detectives had already learned about Steve's lust for his daughter-in-law. Here is how the song started. I said, I love you. Is that a sin? I just might want to say it once again. I love you. Like it or don't. I said, I love you. You should have kissed me. I felt like giving up when you just dissed me. I love you. So put me in jail. I said, I love you. I couldn't help it, and you were mistaken if you thought I'd shelf it. I love you. So cough of my tail. You made my eyes pop out of their sockets. Susan had been Steve's muse for years, his reason for writing. The selection of songs on his website didn't even scratch the surface. He kept an updated tally of songs that she had inspired on his computer. That list grew to include more than 50 titles. In April of 2010, Steve wrote this in his journal. I recently dusted off my song, The Stars Are Twinkling Down in Provo. And when I played it for Josh and Michael, they said it sounded like it was also about Susan. They liked the line, you departed in a hustle, you flipped me off and showed your muscle. Since I wrote the song years ago, Michael called me Nostradamus, a prophet. Steve had even inserted Susan into songs she had not originally inspired. One, titled Liddy with the Sunlight Hair, became Susan with the Sunlight Hair. Soft in my ear, my Lydia, soft as I dream of you. That voice you hear singing the harmony belongs to Susan. She'd reluctantly agreed to record background vocals for Steve. Months before her disappearance, she'd showed the songs to some coworkers. She played it for all of us at work, and we were all laughing about it and how weird that was. And she was laughing along with us and agreeing. It's so weird. There is a place in the instrumental bridge with the line, I'm in love with Susan. Josh said people would find that objectionable, but that's my favorite four seconds in the whole song. My fantasy is that she will return. Josh won't want her. And she'll take up residence in my bedroom. I spent the whole day through waiting for you. 
I could be getting a mistaken impression Each time you seem to gaze at me You let me touch you softly, why is the question And the effect amazes me No sooner had the Tim Peterson theory collapsed than Steve latched on to a new hypothesis. In mid-February of 2010, he called the FBI and asked to meet with agents. He wanted to talk to the feds about Stephen Kocher. I mean, Josh's story may be fishy, but this one's even fishier, you know? Kocher was a resident of St. George, Utah. He had disappeared under bizarre circumstances on December 13th of 2009, a week after Susan's disappearance. Kocher was last seen on a home surveillance video leaving his car at a cul-de-sac in the Las Vegas, Nevada suburb of Henderson. Where he went or what became of him are still unknowns. Like Susan, he has never been found. Steve Powell claimed that because Susan and Kocher were both Latter-day Saints and both from Utah, they must have had a secret relationship. He supposed Susan had hatched an elaborate plan to run off with Kocher, possibly fleeing the country and traveling by land and sea to Fortaleza, Brazil, where Kocher had lived while serving a two-year church mission. Special Agent Russ Johnson from the FBI's Salt Lake City Field Office arranged to meet with Steve on February 24th. And he tapped another special agent from the Tacoma area, Gary France, to take part in the interview. Steve arrived in the afternoon. The agents took him into a room, sat him down, and started to ask about Josh. Did did he know that you were coming in today to talk to us? Yeah, Yeah, yeah. How did he feel about that? Well, you know, he just said, you know, just be aware that they're not, they're not on our side. That's pretty much, you know, because he kind of, that was his experience with the West Valley City Police. And he... This is the actual recording of that interview. This is the first time it has ever been made public. Steve didn't know it, but the FBI had also invited West Valley Police to observe the interview, unseen, from another room. The agents didn't dive into the coacher stuff right away. Instead, they told Steve they were coming to the case late. Much of what they knew, they said, came from the media. Their questions later in the interview (laughs) would prove this was disingenuous. But it made sense for them to try and build some rapport with Steve at the outset. Agents Johnson in France asked Steve about where he was the day Susan disappeared and his communications with Josh since. Steve said he'd had only sporadic contact with Josh on that day and the days that followed. He told the agents he was mm, 75% sure Susan was still alive. He said he was 100% sure Josh had not killed Susan. I I think we'll find her. Uh, I really do. Um, And uh, and the other thing that, that, that has happened since the beginning of this whole process is that, you know, when it first started, I didn't know what happened to her. I didn't have much contact with my son because that is the son who's married to her because the police confiscated his cell phone. He had a crappy cell phone that didn't work. I could Well, how did you hear about it? I mean, how did you hear? He made no secret of the fact Josh had bought another phone and swapped his SIM card into it. Steve conceded that in the first days and weeks after Susan's disappearance, even he had had his doubts about Josh's camping trip alibi. It looked pretty fishy, and uh-huh. so, of course, the, the accusations that came immediately that, oh, you know, yeah, he did something with her, you know, he's, uh, you know, eliminated or whatever. Well, uh, and, of course, being on the other end, you know, anybody's capable of doing that kind of thing. I mean, I could do it. You could do it. I mean, we, you know, you, in, in a fit of anger. Weird you know, things happen in weird relationships. Weird things happen in relationships. But, but, you know, and I tr- struggled with that for, you know, because I couldn't reach Josh half the time on the cell phone. It didn't work. We weren't Is this on Monday? This is, well, this is on Monday and, and even after that, you know, for the next three Were weeks. Were you able to talk to him a couple of oh, times? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every, yeah, every day. Yeah, at least a little bit. In spite of the cell phone problems, yeah. Is there any way you can remember? 
the communication troubles had led to Steve considering a trip to Utah. But he said he'd been so despondent in those early days, he couldn't endure it. Instead, he sent his youngest children, Michael and Alina. Over the phone, he had advised Josh to get a lawyer. Why, why hasn't, haven't the police contacted his attorney? They haven't even contacted him. They haven't? No. They have not no. even contacted the attorney? Not even contacted him. Wow. No, they haven't asked him any questions. The only contact they had was about two weeks ago when Josh was in Salt Lake City or in West Valley City, and they called him and said, we don't have your fingerprints. That was not true. Josh's attorney, Scott Williams, had told West Valley police in December that Josh wouldn't submit to another interview or take a lie detector test. In late March, Williams had sent Ellis an email telling him Josh needed his computers back for tax, professional, and personal endeavors. On February 3rd of 2010, Ellis called Josh's phone number. He knew Josh was in the Salt Lake City area at the time, but didn't know for how long. Josh didn't answer the call, so Ellis left him this voicemail. When you are finished recording, hang up. Or for delivery options, press pound. Hey, Josh, it's Detective Maxwell of West Valley Police Department. Um... Ellis said he needed Josh's fingerprints. He also said he wanted to talk to Josh about Steve's email regarding Tim Peterson. So I have a lot of questions there as well um, in regards to Tim and, and your thoughts and the stuff you didn't share with me. As for the computers? You want to get your... Uh, computer stuff back, uh, the RCFL, they're finding that a lot of your hard drives and a lot of files are encrypted. So need to see if you'll give us those passwords so we don't have to uh, break those encryptions or those codes. All right. Josh didn't call Ellis back, but his defense attorney, Scott Williams, did. Williams told Ellis that Josh couldn't remember the passwords, but might if he were allowed to sit down with the devices. Ellis said they could make that happen, but, of course, Josh never followed through. The agents told Steve they were very skeptical of his claim West Valley detectives had not contacted Josh's attorney. Steve insisted it was the truth. They, they really, if they wanted to talk to him, they missed the boat because he was down at Salt Lake twice since he came up here to, be with, in my, to live in my house. He's been back there twice for several days. And they, if they wanted to talk to him, his attorney is totally available, totally, you know, responsive. Uh, the only thing they've asked for is, you know, when they first got there, they wanted his, his van again, and they took the air filter out, I guess. And don't ask me what that's all about since he's gone all the way from Utah to, to Puyallup and back in the van since this tragedy began. Oh, and, yeah? Uh, when, when did he do that? In fact... The very same day that Steve was sitting down with the FBI agents in Tacoma, Maxwell emailed Williams, asking to schedule a time when Josh might come to the computer lab and try to input his passwords. Also, he noted that Josh had removed the SIM cards from both his and Susan's cell phones before police seized each device. He wanted to get a hold of those as well. Of course, that never happened. Josh never bothered to come and try his passwords. He made no time for it during his Utah visit in early February. Whether that was a failure of communication or a willing dodge on his part remains unclear. I've tried several times to contact Josh's attorney, Scott Williams. He has never responded to my messages or emails. Josh never asked for his computers again. Steve's insistence that the West Valley police had not talked to Josh's attorney suggested that Josh was keeping his dad in the dark. Either that or Steve Powell was lying to the FBI, which is a federal crime. Part of it could be Josh. You know, Josh does not want to spend any more on the attorney fees than he has to, so he's very, he makes his contact. But wouldn't he spend whatever he needs to clear his name? It's really not a, it's not a matter of clearing his name because Josh doesn't feel guilty of anything. He doesn't even feel, in fact, that was one of the things I, you know, after a few days he was at my house, you know, and I said, Josh, um, aren't you worried that they might come and arrest you? And he said, no. Why? Why would they? 
Oh, okay. Steve said Josh was annoyed with the police because they had wasted his time and taken his stuff during December. But that wasn't the worst thing. No, he doesn't have any problem with the police. What he has a problem with is, you know, he feels like when he was there at the police department, the only thing he's not happy about is they lied to him. They would tell him things like, you know, your sons told us that your wife was with you on the camp out. Well, you know, come on. He knew she wasn't with them. And, you know, if, if you planted things in their minds or if you're making this up, you know, th then th the conversation's over, basically, you know. And he, in his back of his mind, he said, you're lying to me. And that's what he said to the, I mean, he didn't say it out loud to the police, but he said that to me later. He said, they were lying to me. I figured they're trying to, they're trying to trump something up here. They're trying to suggest that I have something to do with her disappearance. And, that, and on Wednesday morning... Steve then added another interesting tidbit, saying Josh's younger brother, Michael, who had served in the U.S. Army doing signals and human intelligence work, had debriefed Josh after his police interviews. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. The agents steered the conversation towards Steve's relationship with Susan. Here, he spoke in very frank terms, much more so than he had with West Valley detectives who had interviewed him a couple of months earlier. He described playing various cat and mouse games with her over the course of years, in which he read any incidental physical contact between the two of them as an overt sexual act. In Steve's mind, Susan had instigated it. And at one point when they were planning on moving, I think they were planning on moving to Yakima, I told Susan that I was in love with her. I didn't want her to leave. And she got just came unglued. And it was like, it's okay to play the game, but don't bring it out into the open. You know what I'm saying? So she would not talk to me for three months after that. Okay. Now, as we've already seen, that unwelcome love confession in July of 2003 was primary motivation for Josh and Susan's move to Utah. Susan loathed her father-in-law. Yet Steve truly believed he and Susan continued to share a mutual infatuation. The agents did not scoff at this. Remember, they were trying to gain his trust. Did, you know, the, the natural question is, uh, you know, did you guys actually ever have any actual contact of any sexual nature or anything, or was it just always these uh, little brushes that, that, that well, you I mean, said she yeah, played I mean, the game on? One time, you know, I was massaging her feet, and she was putting her feet in my crotch and everything. Yeah, stuff like that, but no, you're talking about actual physical sex? Yeah. No, we actually never had sex. Okay. Because I don't think... That's why I kind of don't, I didn't think she would go that far, but maybe it was just with me. I don't know. See, I'm, I'm going back. Steve said this kind of activity had continued even after Josh and Susan left Washington, though far less frequently. As an example, he told the agents that while Josh and Susan were visiting Washington in 2008, he had brushed up against her bare breast while she was feeding Brayden. So Josh was aware of some of these cat and mouse games that she was well she i don't think he was aware of it after that because it was you know it was so subtle i mean gary yeah. this susan is very subtle okay. you know like just like that whole thing yeah. pressing her breasts against my hands yeah you know she didn't have to do that she wanted to do it you know what i'm saying right. she wanted to do it wow susan had described steve using words like wicked she told her parents he was a pedophile. If there was one person in the world she did not want to touch her, it was Steve Powell. He blamed that attitude on her religion, which he claimed she only practiced to please her parents. Susan's own writings and actions contradict this. Not only did she regularly attend her church services, she also took on volunteer church assignments and fought against Josh to pay 10% of her income in tithing. Susan's faith was a core pillar of her identity, not something she practiced out of grudging obligation. Steve's claims grew even more egregious. He told the agents that hot-tempered Susan 
had been abusing her two young sons. I mean, I, I, I've been very open with you about Susan's abuse. I mean, yeah, that, could, that could be a motive. We that could be a motive. Yeah. And, and, and for Josh, who just absolutely adores his sons, it could be a motive. But I don't believe it for a minute that, that, that anything happened like that, that that created, but maybe it created, maybe it was... None of the people who knew Susan well, who I've spoken to for this podcast, ever shared a similar concern. None of her friends, co-workers, or relatives ever saw Susan strike Charlie or Brayden. I specifically asked Josh's sister Jennifer about this claim of abuse. Did you ever see anything like that? Susan was so loving to her children. She was not abusive to them in any way. I never witnessed or heard through the grapevine from anyone that there was anything like that going on on her side. On the other hand, there were issues that Josh was doing that I was highly concerned about. He was regularly undermining her authority as a mother and that was really hard on her and on her relationship with her children and, and on her ability to be a good parent. Now, Susan was not a saint. She did have flaws. For example, she can be heard snapping at Charlie in this 2008 video she made documenting the family's property in preparation for a possible divorce. Hey, be quiet, Charlie. Josh cut the doorbell <coughs> wire. Shh, be quiet or I'm going to spank you. But this is the kind of thing many an exasperated young mother might say to a misbehaving child. Steve wanted to twist that into something much more sinister. The agents asked if he ever actually witnessed Susan commit an act of abuse. He conceded that he had not, but said he had overheard things on the phone. Josh, he said, was very protective of the boys. I mean, these are his boys. Josh dotes on them. He, he would guard them with his life. Finally, after more than an hour and a half, the conversation turned to the topic of Stephen Kocher. Steve Powell, with pen and paper in hand, started scratching out a rough map of Utah, Arizona, and Nevada. And this is Kosher up here, right? He marked the cities important to his theory. Okay, here's Salt Lake City. Here's West Valley City. Okay, here's the highway that goes over to uh, Wendover, Montana. Oh, Wendover, Nevada. Gotcha and went about trying to explain how he believed Stephen Kocher's and Susan's lives might have intersected. They each at one point had worked in downtown Salt Lake City, in offices separated by a few city blocks. Perhaps, he suggested, they had somehow met and developed a secret romance. But I surmise she disappears on the morning of the 7th, calls him, and says, I'm ready, we're ready to take, undertake the plan. He comes up on the night of the 7th, spends the night at, in, my, in my document, in my uh, uh, timeline I refer to at a safe house. There's somebody in, in West Valley City that knows what was going on, as far as I'm concerned. He spends, they spend the night at that person's house because that's where she would have gone after she, you know, quote unquote, disappeared. From there, Steve's theory had Kocher slipping down to the Las Vegas area with Susan, where he staged his own disappearance before renting a boat, possibly with the help of a friend, in order to float south toward the U.S.-Mexico border. You can t take this as, as coming from a crazy person or whatever you want to say, but I would, I would put money on the possibility that they're not even in this country. I would, you know, I, you know, I see... I see heading south in a boat as far as they could go, finding other tra ground transportation or whatever to Mexico City, picking up a flight or maybe going across to, the, to one of the coasts of Mexico and picking up uh, a ship, you know, and, and heading down to Fort Valesa where he would know people. You know, I mean, I went on a mission to Argentina. You know, at the time, I, I mean, it's so many years ago, I don't know anybody now, but back then, 
If I called somebody and certain people and said, you know, I'm coming down there with my fiance, we're going to get married, you know, mm -hmm. they'd say, wow, come, you know, it would stay at our place, you know. What possible reason could Susan have for going along with such an outlandish plot? Steve said she had once mentioned wanting to learn Portuguese, the primary language spoken in Brazil. What's more, he said she was overwhelmed by the boys and, motivated by a desire to get pregnant again, attracted to Kocher. There were many, many problems with this idea. The timelines didn't quite mesh. Steve's theory required Susan and Kocher to share a common acquaintance, someone who could sneak Susan away unseen and hide her for at least a day. Steve couldn't point to a single friend they shared. In order to cross international boundaries, Susan would have needed a passport. She didn't have one. Steve figured she must have had a forgery made. He also believed her background in cosmetology would have allowed her to change her appearance and assume a false identity once on the run. It was a story more at home in a B-grade spy movie than an actual criminal investigation. Yet if Steve's theory didn't stand on its merits, it did seem capable of at least sowing a small seed of doubt. And perhaps that was the point all along. In his personal journal, Steve Powell later wrote of Josh, If he were brought to trial, the coacher connection would be more than enough evidence to convince a jury that there is reasonable doubt as to his guilt. The storyline Steve was spinning for the FBI and anyone else who would listen, including his own children, was that Susan had tried to frame Josh. Seriously, Gary, the scenario for Susan disappearing and Josh being blamed was perfect. It was perfect. Maybe a little too perfect. Yeah. But anyway, it was perfect. You know, Josh takes off on one of his late night campouts. I mean, the campout was probably planned for noon that day, noon on Sunday. And it may, have, and it may not have been either. See, I, I, I'm not prying into Josh's all this stuff because Josh's attorney has said, you know, don't speculate about anything. Don't talk about what happened, even to your family that day. Just, you know, you and I know what happened. The police know what happened. Just drop it, you know. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't do anything for you. So I look at it. West Valley Police did take the coacher lead and investigate it. I will have more to say about that in a future episode. But for the two FBI agents who were listening to Steve on February 24th of 2010, his theory proved far from convincing. Special Agent Johnson decided to level with Steve. He explained he wasn't on anyone's side, not the Powell family's side, not the Cox family's side, not the West Valley police's side, but he knew things that had not yet made the news. But from what I know, okay, mm -hmm. um, and some of the things that have happened around this disappearance and specifically some of the things that Josh uh, has done and said, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I think, and, uh, and I think you're going to probably have to um, at some point wrap your mind around this. It sounds like you started right where I'm going to be mm -hmm. and then you went away from that based mm -hmm. on Josh's behavior. But I think you're going to have to wrap your, your mind around the fact I think Josh is going to be arrested and charged with this crime. Okay? With what crime? With, with, uh, uh, with a homicide. Okay. okay. So you and think she's dead? I do. Okay. okay. And like I said, um, this is um, me coming with agenda <laughs> from somewhere else mm -hmm. and, um, and not having an interest in it. I think that is what's going to happen. When that happens... Uh, I, I don't think Josh has told you even all the things that have happened. I think he knows a lot of this stuff that I know, and I don't think he's told you. Um, you may want to uh, find some of that out for yourself so that you can prepare yourself if, if this happens the way I say. Mm -hmm. Okay? And if it happens that way, and I, I really think it will, you, uh, you need to be aware um, that, you know, that that's coming. 
and uh, and get get ready for that. Hmm. Okay, that's I'm not saying I have the inside track and yeah. and and uh, and I know exactly what West Valley and the DA's office is going to do. I'm mm -hmm. saying this is this is me guessing right now. Okay, and I think that's going to happen. Um, I think that uh, the things that I know are highly suspicious, um, and it's not. Um, and I don't think that the other things that I know indicate that um, Susan went anywhere voluntarily. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion to you is start thinking about that. Okay. And and make sure you are not um, involved. And I'm not accusing you of anything right now. Okay. I'm, not, I'm just saying make sure you never get involved with the covering up or the obstruction of, of the investigation. And, you know, hey, you're here. You're not doing that, obviously. You're here talking to us. You want to help. But when things go that other way, don't be involved in any of that. Don't put yourself in any jeopardy. If he, when he gets arrested uh, for this, those grandkids are going to need people that they know and love around them. Cold listeners take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. You don't have to choose between outdated, chemically heavy, hair-frying box color or the time and expense of a salon. Crafted in Italy by master colorists, Madison Reed delivers professional hair color you can do at home with a step-by-step -step guide that makes you an expert, and it's less than $25. Those master colorists blend nuances of light, dark, cool, and warm to create over 45 gorgeous multi-tonal shades. Women love the results. This is gray covering, game-changing color you can do at home and look as if you just came from the salon. It's ammonia-free, ingredients you can feel good about. There's even a tool on the site to help you match the exact right shade for you. Visit madison-reed.com. That's madison-reed.com. And now, cold listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on your first color kit. Use code COLD. That's code COLD. The FBI told Steve Powell two and a half months into the investigation that his son was likely to be arrested for Susan's murder. What's more, the agents explicitly warned him he could himself wind up in trouble if he attempted to help Josh conceal evidence. Steve did not buy it. Well, now, it, it, so, so are you telling me that you've got some information that says that <clears throat> everything that I just said is hooey, that, that, that Stephen Kosher could not possibly have anything to do with it? I don't know anything about Stephen Kosher, really. I can't, I can't comment on that. Has anybody looked into this? They urged Steve to apply pressure to get Josh to work with the police. Make sure that, um, you know, if you, if you really believe that, 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 uh, that your initial feelings were wrong and that Josh truly isn't involved. I totally believe that. Then you need to get him cleared. And that means his cooperation in this matter. His, his attorney can be there. That's fine. There's so many unanswered questions, such what appears to be highly suspicious behavior from Josh. Okay? And uh, why, have the, why haven't the police seen this? I can't as, answer that. I don't yeah, know. I mean, you know. That's what, I mean, you know, first of all. Steve wondered how much of the information in the hands of police had come from his estranged daughter, Jennifer, the daughter who a month prior had visited the Powell family home and confronted Josh while secretly wearing a wire. If any of this information is coming from my daughter, Jenny, please, please, please be aware this girl is filled with hate. It's not. Okay, well, because she had made some comments, you know, to me that, oh, I saw Josh doing this and doing the, that. And, and there may be some now. information that comes from her. I don't know. I don't know mm -hmm. anything about that. Well, yours I, just have, I just have some, yeah. some facts and some and some evidence yeah. that, that I have been made aware of, yeah. and I wasn't there to collect it or anything. Yeah. I've been made aware of, and and it does not 
it does not look good okay. for Josh. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Okay. And, uh, Let me step in here for a moment and provide some perspective. I have obviously interviewed Jennifer. I've read her book, A Light in Dark Places. It's a portrait of pain, loss, hope, and faith. Not hate. I asked Jennifer about what her father told the FBI. Here is what she said. Well, let me tell you about my dad. I grew up with my dad. I know how he works. My dad was a very deceitful person. But at the same time, he was a very smooth talker. And he could convince anybody for the longest time that he was this wonderful person. And he could smooth over any lie forever. So does Jennifer think the FBI agents were buying the Stephen Kocher conspiracy theory? I am sure that he went in there and talked really smoothly to them. But as time went on, the lies started to unravel. And this is where, this is where finally my dad's true face, my dad's true nature was revealed. Let's go back to the interview. I'm a, I'm a father and I have kids. If you knew Josh did something or if he told you something, would you come forward and tell us? I'm not sure I would. Okay. But, but the reality so thanks for is, being honest. Thank you. I'm being not honest. sure I would. But as I said, I am, you know, unless you've got something pretty, pretty, pretty tight, I, I'm, I'm 100% convinced. I mean, you know, uh, I, I'd really like to see the evidence, but I understand you can't show it to me. I might be able to. You know, okay. if I get into this, if I get into this and, and, I, and I, I need your help, I might be able to come to you and say, look, here's a couple things that, that, that we know. You know, yeah. does that change? Yeah. Does that change what you think? Yeah. And if that, you say, no, and if you say, yeah. and if you say, no, I don't, you know, then then we're still there. But if you say, oh wow, I didn't know that, yeah. you know, and then you know maybe you know we could, yeah. maybe, you know, keep that dialogue going. You know, yeah. I, I would be. He also worried about what would happen to Charlie and Braden. If, if he's if something happened to Susan, I don't want something to happen to their father. Mm -hmm. That would probably be my biggest concern. Okay. That actually entered my head, right. too, when I was thinking about that, that, you know, if, if my son told me, Dad, I didn't, I didn't plan this, uh, something snapped, it, it happened, um, I, I, don't, I don't even know who I was at that moment, you know? Because even when you first walked in here, you said, we're all capable, and I think you're right. We that are. scares me sometimes. From there... The conversation took on a chilling and, in retrospect, prophetic tone. Agent Johnson proposed a hypothetical situation in which Josh had killed Susan, covered up the murder, and then fled with the boys. If, if Josh did that, something's broken. Oh, it's yeah. There. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, I've thought of that, now, too. Russ, what, I really have. What if... What if one of the kids starts saying something? Saying something like You what? know, like uh, coming out with information that, that he didn't come out with before. What's Josh going to do? Well, he loves his kids. You know, you might think he'd never do anything to his kids. But if something's broken, maybe he would. I'm not sure I understand where you're getting at because... If he uh, would kill his wife oh. because he's got something oh, broken you're saying inside he'd, of him. He'd kill his kids. He might. You know, do you, do we know that? I know you're just saying, oh, he'd never do that. But I don't think so. But not. I don't. Would think you have said that about the wife? You know, I mean, and, and no, it, I would have said. You know what, Russ? Let me tell. Let me put it to you bluntly. Mm -hmm. Over the last couple of years, I have. It has occurred to me that Susan would have killed Josh, but it never would dawn on me that it would be the other way around. And that would mm -hmm. never even cross my mind mm -hmm. until December seventh. Until December 7th, then I started thinking, could he have done this? At this point, I don't believe for it at all that he did it. But it did occur to me that Susan was, was capable of doing something like that, seriously. Yeah. 
that mention of Josh killing the boys, did it send a shiver up your spine? And then Steve suggesting, against all available evidence, that Susan might have wanted to kill Josh? He told the FBI agents, who he had earlier asked if they were Mormons, to consider that the church might be trying to silence Susan. The way he saw it, Susan's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox, had rallied their fellow Latter-day Saints in an effort to steal Charlie and Brayden away from Josh. There are some huge religious undercurrents in this thing. That whole Dr. Phil show was about... We want to get custody of those boys from Josh. The grandparents want to. They don't want them in my home because I'm an ex-Mormon and I am a rabid anti-Mormon. Rabid. You know, I, I, I have nothing good to say about that religion. Nothing good. And I read about it constantly. I am, you know, they don't want those kids in my home and they will do anything. Lie, cheat, steal to get those boys away from my home. Keep that in mind as you look into this. I am, I am Satan incarnate as far as they're concerned. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll note yeah. that. Please yeah. note that. Yeah. This is really a scary thing. Even the church itself, I, I'm glad to be talking to somebody in Tacoma, Washington, somebody who's not a Mormon, somebody who's not in Salt Lake City, simply because the church itself would obfuscate an investigation if they thought it would throw some damaging light on the church. They would do that. I mean, believe me, they would do that. Mm -hmm. So if... Well, if they wouldn't be very successful with, with anything federal. Not good, yeah. good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that. Although... Having heard out the FBI's hypothetical, Steve then posed one of his own. We don't have any videotapes of Susan's disappearance, quote-unquote. Well, all we know is that she's gone. Right. She went somewhere, or somebody took her somewhere, you know, we right. don't know. And you're, you're seem, you seem to be of the opinion, based on whatever evidence you have, that maybe Josh had something to do with that disappearance. That's my so opinion, opinion. That's but I'm opinion. open. I'm open. Okay, if, if she did walk away, and she did it to frame Josh, and she's, you know, just went to Brazil, start a new life, you know, because her boyfriend knows Portuguese, and... Yeah, let's just go down there. We're together, and this guy really fits. If you look at his picture, he fits the profile of the type of person she'd be attracted to. He looks not like, doesn't look like Josh, but he has the sandy blonde hair, the blue eyes, all this. You know what I'm saying? Um, so let's suppose we do find out that she has basically done this, and now Josh has been framed. Let's suppose Josh is arrested because of this. Whatever, has she broken a law? Could she be extradited from Brazil for, you know, to, to face, you know, the music or yeah. whatever? Yeah, I don't know what the, I don't know what the case law is on yeah. that. Oh, I mean, I it know. happens occasionally where somebody disappears and especially if there's fraud involved. And, yeah, and they, and, yeah. You know. Steve quickly latched on to this idea of fraud, adding it to his coacher conspiracy theory. He decided Susan must have been bankrolling her new life abroad by siphoning money away from customer accounts she could have accessed through her work at Wells Fargo Investments. That was baloney. There was no evidence to back up such a claim. Susan was not a white-collar criminal, just as she wasn't abusing her children or plotting her husband's death. To use a young Josh's own words, Steve perceived these things to be true because he wanted them to be true. When West Valley detectives had talked to Steve in December, they'd finished by doing a quick search of his house. The special agents did something similar. They asked Steve for permission to review records for both his home and cell phone numbers. So be my guest, no look at them. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, Josh, that, those two days used a prepaid cell phone. I mean, you know, if you think they're... There's some chance that he maybe had that, and God only knows. I mean, you know, it was communicating with somebody else or was doing something. Yeah, and it's, just to, it's just to, just to help make sure. yourselves. Yeah, yeah, let's make sure. I mean, you know, I, you know, I told you I would probably not say anything, but, you know, if, if I knew if Josh confessed to me, which 
what's the likelihood? You know what I'm saying? What's the likelihood that Josh is going to come and say, oh, by the way, I um, just want to get this off my chest. Uh, you know, I, I threw in a hole up on, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it just isn't, that, that, what's the likelihood? But, but the point is... As they reached the end of their hours-long conversation, the agents again stressed to Steve the need for Josh to start talking. I, I would just, I, I mean, if you, guys, if you guys really want to have your day with Josh, you really do, mm -hmm. Sure. Get, his, get a hold of his attorney and tell him that. Just say, can we get him down there? And then, and then pay for a plane ticket. Be ready to send it, put a plane ticket, because Josh doesn't have any money and he's not going to pay his attorney to come up here and talk to you guys. He, he, they had ample opportunity down there, and if you guys are late in the investigation, that's not Josh's problem. You know, don't make him pay for something because they didn't, they neglected to do we, their homework. We, we'd pay for a plane ticket. Okay, good. Yeah, talk to his attorney. Just tell him that. Just None of that ever happened. It was an empty promise. And Steve, if he knew anything, wasn't going to cooperate either. West Valley Police would have to resort to other means. A figure crept forward through the stillness of the early morning, shielded by dark. It was quiet after 3 a.m. on May 5th of 2010. Police were inside the community of Silver Creek. Two minivans sat in the driveway of a home at the corner of 186th and 94th Avenue Court East. The shadowy figure slinked up to one and then the other, slipping a small device onto each vehicle. They were GPS beacons, court-approved tracking devices, with transmitters that would allow the police to remotely follow the minivans, no matter where they went. One for Josh's minivan, one for Steve's. It wasn't the first time police had put a tracker on Josh's minivan. They kept hoping he might unwittingly lead them to Susan. But the Powells felt the eyes of police on them. In his email to police in mid-January of 2010, Steve Powell had questioned if the cops were keeping watch for suspects around the Sarah Circle house. Josh and Michael tell me there are some cameras watching the Powell house, mounted on the light poles. They didn't know if it was your agency, the FBI, or the media doing the spying. Steve should have been more worried about his own house. The GPS trackers on the two vans, as well as on a third minivan Steve used for work, were part of a major operation. It involved round-the-clock eyes-on surveillance of Josh and Steve Powell during early May 2010. A large group of West Valley detectives and command staff made the 15-hour trip up from Utah to take part. Comically, some of them ended up heading right back. On the afternoon of May 5th, Josh drove to his storage unit and retrieved some stuff. At about 7 p.m., he started the long drive south and east toward Utah. The West Valley team had to split up. Some stayed in Puyallup to watch Steve, while the others tailed Josh. It was a grueling task. Josh drove until 3.30 a.m., finally exiting I-84 at Glens Ferry, Idaho. He parked his van near the city pool and slept in the car for about five hours. Josh was back on the road a bit before 9 a.m. on the morning of the 6th. He made a pit stop at the nearby Bliss Rest area, then continued on to Tremont in Utah, where he stopped for gas. Josh arrived in the Salt Lake Valley early in the afternoon. He passed by Susan's old workplace, then went to Aspen, the company from which he had been fired in December. Aspen's HR manager was startled and a bit uncomfortable to see him, since she was alone. Josh explained he was just there to return some IT books. She told him that wasn't necessary. He could have just kept them. As Josh made his way out of the building, she told him not to come around again without first getting permission. Next, Josh drove to the house on Sarah Circle. Uh, he just showed up. He didn't let us know. 
Yeah. Dax and Mindy Guzman had rented the house from Josh after he'd moved out in January. And it was weird because, like, we knew what was going on, you know, the investigation, so it was like, dude, you kind of, if you're going to come into the house, there's, like, rules. You need to let your tenants know. You don't, don't just show up. Like, no, he was like, oh, sorry, nothing, I just got to grab stuff. The stuff he grabbed was leftovers that he hadn't loaded up back in January. As part of their deal, Josh had asked Dax to finish the house's basement. He walked through that afternoon, showing the Guzmans where he wanted walls framed and where the doors should go. Josh's relationship with the Guzmans had never been great. They'd been friendly as neighbors, mostly because of Susan. But shortly after they'd moved into the Sarah Circle house, Josh told Dax and Mindy he'd kill to have his wife back. That was the one and only time that he made any kind of comment that had anything to do with his wife's disappearance. For him, it was business. You know, what's happening, uh, where the progress is, what he wanted with the stairs, what he wanted, you know, just, that's all it was. It was never... At about 7.30 p.m., Josh left the house to grab some Chinese takeout. The detectives who were tailing him could see the passenger compartment of his van was packed full of household items. A pair of plastic 50-gallon totes were also strapped to the outside of the van. They were the last of Josh's Utah possessions. He left the house again around 11 p.m., headed for the freeway. He stopped once along the way to make sure the load was lashed tight, then started back toward Washington. He had been in Utah for less than 12 hours. Josh drove into southern Idaho. At about 2.30 a.m., he left the freeway a bit east of Twin Falls and north of the Snake River. He parked and went to sleep. The team of detectives tailing Josh had traded off shifts while he was in Utah. They had fresh eyes and kept a constant watch as he slept. The van did not move for a full eight hours. At 10.30 that morning, May 7th, he resumed the drive to Washington. Josh went well below the speed limit, apparently concerned going too fast might cause the stuff strapped to the outside of his minivan to break loose. That meant that an already long drive was taking even longer. Back in Washington, the rest of the West Valley surveillance team was keeping an eye on Steve. He hadn't done all that much while Josh was gone, just going to work and the gym. The other Powell kids who were living in the house didn't even set foot outside. That afternoon, the team in Washington sent some detectives to relieve the group that was tailing Josh. Unfortunately, a major traffic jam had cars backed up for more than nine miles. The two groups of cops missed each other. Josh finally made it back to his dad's house just before midnight, more than 24 hours after leaving West Valley City. The next afternoon, he went to his storage unit and unloaded the van. His dad made a stop at a local landfill. On May 9th, they returned to the landfill together, then went to a thrift store and donated some items. Josh was ditching Susan's stuff. On the morning of Monday, May 10th, Steve left home and caught a bus headed for Tacoma. He was on his way to pick up his work van after the weekend. While on the bus, he took out a pen and started to write in the spiral-bound notebook he used as a journal. I wonder if Susan is missing me. I have these images of Susan in mind, sunbathing and strolling on nude beaches in Brazil, letting everyone and anyone see what I've longed to see. I've also fantasized about being at a nude resort with her myself. If Steve knew he was being watched, he didn't let on. Yesterday was Mother's Day, and I bought some plants with flowers for the boys to plant in Susan's honor. The flowers were purple, which is the color her parents have chosen as her favorite. I don't know if that's true, but I went with it. On Tuesday, May 11th, the West Valley team went and knocked on the door of Steve's house. They were flanked by U.S. Marshal Daryl Spencer and FBI Special Agent Gary France. Steve answered and allowed them to come inside he again provided consent for them to look around. Special Agent France found a locked file cabinet in Steve's bedroom. Inside were photos of Susan, 
including some voyeuristic shots in which she was dressed only in her underwear. There were other, more disturbing pictures, including pornographic images of women with their faces removed and replaced by Susan's. France found pictures of Steve exposing himself and performing lewd acts while looking at pictures of Susan. France also found women's underwear, temple garments considered sacred by Latter-day Saints, which Steve had stolen from Susan's laundry basket. France confronted Steve about the pictures and asked where he'd got them. Steve said he had taken some of them, the others he had copied off of Josh's computer without Josh's knowledge. Josh was at the house too. In fact, he was sitting at his computer when the police entered. He had quickly shut it down. When the police rebooted it, they discovered its contents were encrypted. The FBI had placed a tracker of its own on Josh's minivan. Legally, they were required to tell him about it now that they were taking it off. So they did. So if you've been tracking me, then you know that I just went to Salt Lake City, Josh said. I wasn't trying to hide anything. I made sure that I left my phone on. I used my cell phone and my credit cards. That remark got their attention. During his December camping trip, Josh had kept his phone off and not used his credit cards. He obviously understood they could be used to track his movements. One of the detectives told Josh they wanted to take a peek inside his storage unit and see what he had brought back from Utah. The investigators drove to the storage unit. Josh opened it up and moved some stuff around so they could get a better look. The only noteworthy thing was a split geode. A long, single strand of hair clung to it. The geode and hair were probably from the camping trip Josh and Susan had taken with the boys to the Dugway geode beds in May of 2009, a year earlier. Police took them as evidence, just in case. Steve wrote about his interactions with the investigators on that day in his journal. I had a sense that they had found her, even though they refused to acknowledge that. They wanted to check out our computers to find out if we had any contact with Susan since December 7th. I think it was apparent to them that the answer to that question was negative. Steve understood, as well as the police did, just what Josh's final move out of the West Valley City home meant. Josh never expected or intended to be with Susan again. Ellis Maxwell knew Steve had not given up hope. In his mind, she was still alive. And... I'm sure at some point he probably thought she's hiding from Josh for a minute and then she's going to come back and be with Steve. I mean, this guy's uh, so left to center, it's it's crazy. I spent the whole day through waiting for you. I could be getting a mistaken impression each time you seem to gaze at me. Here is what Steve wrote in his journal on May 17th of 2010. Even if she's not into some deep doo-doo, she really no longer has a home. Josh has rented out their house. He really doesn't want her back and doesn't particularly want her to be around the boys. I would take her into my home and bedroom in a minute, but I would have to deal with some very strong objections from my kids. I'm sure none of them would be thrilled to have her shack up with me and become by default the queen of the house. on the next episode of Cold. I just said, you know, why don't you be a bigger man and not give those journals out to anyone? Those are childhood journals. And he's going, well, you don't know what I went through. You don't know. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Cold. Toss us a rating or a review. You can find Cold on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Cold Podcast. For video clips, pictures from the case, and more, hit up thecoldpodcast.com. Also, if Susan's story sounds familiar in your own life, in other words, if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse in any form, please get immediate help. In the U.S., support is a phone call away at the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-7233, 
or online at www.thehotline.org. A quick thank you to the team. Kristen Sorensen, Eric Openshaw, Ken Fall, Danielle Prager, Kira Faramond, Becky Bruce, Josh Tilton, Adam Mason, Jillian Friedman, and especially Cheryl Worsley. The music for Cold was composed by Michael Bonmiller, except for the guitar stuff. That was me. Cold is a KSL podcast. Thank you for listening.